On October 2nd, 2019, a security researcher discovered an incredibly dangerous vulnerability deep rooted within the Android operating system Kernel, which was exploitable through Facebook's messaging application WhatsApp. The vulnerability allowed attackers to gain access and take control of a victim's device by merely sending them a GIF on WhatsApp. The GIF would result in a reverse shell connection being established between the victim's device and the attacker's device which could lead to the attacker accessing the device's data, installing malware, or running more sophisticated attacks of the attacker's choosing. In order to understand how this vulnerability works, we first need to understand the basics behind GIFs. As we all know, a GIF, or a graphics interchange format, is an image file format that is capable of containing multiple bitmap frames, resulting in video playback. Normally, the frames in a GIF all have the same size, however this is not actually enforced by the GIF specification. It is completely valid to construct a GIF where different frames are of different sizes, even including frame sizes of zero. When GIFs are rendered within Android, the Android standard GIF library, Android GIF Drawable, uses the GIF info structure to store information about GIFs. Let's take a look at the raster bits buffer. This is a buffer that stores each decoded GIF frame one at a time. As the GIF plays, the current frame will be stored in the raster bits buffer. The size of the buffer is determined by the size of the frame being stored in the buffer. If we had a frame size of 640 by 480, the raster bits buffer would allocate 307,200 bytes for itself. If we get into the case where we have different frame sizes, the buffer may need to be reallocated. As we can see in the source code, we will need to reallocate the buffer if the new frame size is larger overall, if the width is larger, or if the height is larger. Let's say we have a GIF with the first frame being of size 5x5. If the next frame is size 2x2, the buffer would not need to be reallocated, as the reallocation condition is not met. If the next frame after that is 10x10 though, the buffer would need to be reallocated. So far this makes sense. What actually is reallocation under the hood though? To understand allocation and reallocation, we first need to understand pointers. Pointers are just variables that store memory addresses, essentially pointing to a location in memory. For example, if we want to dynamically allocate memory in C, we can use malloc, short for memory allocation. Malloc returns the memory address of a chunk of memory, large enough to store an integer in this case. Because it returns a memory address, we store this in a pointer, using an asterisk. Because PTR is now a pointer, printing it will now show us the memory address that malloc allocated for us. We can then do various things with this, such as storing an integer in the allocated memory, and we can access what is in the memory by dereferencing the pointer with an asterisk. Something very important to note is that whenever you're done with the allocated memory in your program, you should deallocate it with free. This releases the memory pointed to by the pointer, making it free and available for future use. If you forget to free your allocated memory after you are done with it, this could lead to a memory leak, as your program would keep on allocating memory without deallocating it. This is where reallocation comes in. When we hit one of our reallocation conditions, we reallocate the buffer with the realloc function. Realloc is a function that accepts a pointer and the new size that the memory block should be scaled to. This is where the first attack vector comes into play, the double free. A double free is a type of memory management error that occurs when free is called on a memory block that has been freed already. In other words, the program tries to release memory that is no longer allocated. This is dangerous and unsafe, and leads to something called undefined behavior. Undefined behavior is not guaranteed to be predictable, and can result in various unexpected and undesirable outcomes, including crashes, data corruption, or security vulnerabilities. The dangerous thing with this is that we can cause a double free by calling realloc twice in a row with the same pointer and with a size of zero. Normally, this should not happen. Lower level C operations tend to be highly dependent on the compiler, the C library implementation, and the operating system. Depending on the reallocation size and the current memory state, realloc can be thought of as a free and a malloc. What should happen under regular circumstances in a regular environment is that the first realloc call should free the memory and then subsequently allocate a new block of memory. The new allocation could either return a valid pointer to a zero sized block or a null pointer. The second time realloc is called, this will not cause a double free since the pointer is no longer in reference to the same memory block. 
The issue with this specific implementation in Android is that a call to realloc with the size of 0 will not allocate any new memory, nor will it nullify the pointer. It will skip the malloc part entirely and only free the memory. This means that a realloc call with the size of 0 is exactly equivalent as a call to free. As we can now see, calling realloc twice with the size of 0 will actually cause a double free. Now, once again, in Android, rather than the double free causing undefined behavior, it is going to cause predetermined behavior. What it does in this case is when you double free memory with the size of n, the next two subsequent malloc calls of size n are going to return the same address. For example, if we malloc 4 bytes and then double free it, the next two subsequent calls to malloc with the size of 4 bytes are going to return the exact same memory address as we can see here. This is incredibly dangerous behavior. This is where the second attack vector comes into play. In WhatsApp, for whatever reason, GIFs are parsed twice. Let's go ahead and walk through an example by creating our malicious GIF. Let's make the first frame 8 by 21, which is a size of 168 bytes. This has to be exactly 168 bytes, and we're going to see why in a moment. The second frame is going to be 0 by any number, let's say 100, and the third frame is going to be 0 by any other number, let's say 200. The fourth frame and onward isn't going to matter. Let's walk through what happens as the GIF is parsed by WhatsApp. Before parsing any frames, the GIF info structure itself is allocated with the size of 168 bytes. This is a constant value based on the fact that the GIF info structure has 21 properties, 8 bytes each. Recall that we chose our first frame to match the size on purpose. Once the struct is created, we parse the first frame, where raster bits is allocated to 168 bytes. Then, when frame 2 is parsed, we hit the reallocation condition, and realloc is called with a size of 0, resulting in a free. When frame 3 is parsed, we hit the reallocation condition again, however the size is also a 0, resulting in a subsequent call to free, which is exactly where we hit our double free. The only reason why we hit the reallocation condition twice, despite the size being 0 each time, is because only the width or the height needs to change to trigger a reallocation. Because of the double free, we now know that the next two allocations of size 168 will return the same memory address. Frame 4 onward does not cause any issues. Now, due to this weird double parsing behavior of WhatsApp, the GIF is going to be parsed again. The GIF info structure on the second time is now allocated with the 168 bytes. When frame 1 is parsed, raster bits is going to be allocated with the size of 168 bytes, which now returns the same memory address as the GIF info struct itself. This is due to the previous double free of a pointer with a size of 168. Normally, this would just cause the app to crash, but in this case, the attacker took it further, leading to an RCE or remote code execution, where he could open a reverse shell with access to the victim's phone. Since the GIF info structure now has the same size and memory address as our first frame, the program now thinks that our first frame is the GIF info object itself. This means that we have complete control over what the program thinks is the GIF info structure. One of the properties within the GIF info structure is a function pointer to a rewind function, which is called after all of the frames of the GIF are done being parsed. Its place within the GIF info object is constant. We can prepare our first frame in such a way where when the program goes to execute the rewind function, it actually executes whatever we want. The following is going to be quite complex due to write XOR execute policy within Android, but bear with me. To go any further, we are going to need to dive into assembly. Let's take a look at two of the special registers within assembly, being the PC and the X0 registers. PC just refers to program counter and stores the address of the next instruction to be executed. The X0 register stores the address of the first function argument. Now, this is an example of a command that can be used to create a reverse shell. To execute this command on the victim's machine, we would need to hand it to the system function within C. It is now our goal to call this function with this argument. 
This means that at some point in time, the system function would need to be contained within the PC register, and her argument would need to be contained within the X0 register. The attacker does this by jumping to an intermediate gadget found in the libhwui.so library, which happens to serve her purposes perfectly. We can now place the address of this gadget where the program thinks the rewind function would be, which is at offset 0x80. When the program calls what it thinks is the rewind function, it is going to end up at this gadget instead. The LDR instruction loads the value from x19 with offset 0x18 to x8. x19 is just our first frame that we have here, and the BLR is just a branch instruction, which is basically just a function call, which is going to call the function stored in x8. This means that we can put the address of the system function into offset 0x18, which is right here. This will result in the system function being called at the branch instruction. The add instruction places the contents of 0x20 into the xo register, meaning if we put our argument at that place in the first frame, it will be loaded into xo. Now, when x8 is called, we are calling the system function with our argument, and the reverse shell is gained to the victim's device. The only missing piece here is that we need the address of the gadget and of the C system function to make this work in the first place. This can be done with a separate malicious application installed on the victim's phone, which can get these addresses quite easily, as they are from native Android libraries and they only change during reboots. This can also be done with other information disclosure vulnerabilities, which are beyond the scope of this video. The vulnerability was since patched in a WhatsApp patch, as well as an update to the Android GIF library. If you're interested in other low-level nuances, check out this video, or click here for more vulnerability breakdowns, and subscribe to the channel for more content. Thanks for watching.